<clears throat> All right, well, thanks everybody. Uh, looks like we've got a pretty good turnout here. Um, uh, so <clears throat> I was really delighted when I got the initial notice that uh, Marlise was gonna be uh, presenting at these critical care rounds. And then uh, uh, Wael reminded me that this is actually trying to catch up for her visit that was supposed to happen a couple of years ago now as the William J. Sybil visiting professor. Um, and I forget, I don't know, something happened around that March of 2020. I, I don't know, I'm getting kind of old and my old time are kicking in, so I can't quite remember exactly what it was, but I, I do know the visit was canceled and we're just now uh, uh, kind of catching up with that. So part of my introduction is actually to remind all the young people on the call who might not know who Bill Sybil was about, about Bill. Um, so very, very briefly, I think uh, worldwide, he's recognized as a pioneer and leader in critical care. And certainly in Canada, he's one of the uh, founders of the profession. He practiced most of his career in London, but he was born nearby in Guelph, um, trained at Western, went to Wayne State to do his critical care training. And, um, and was one of the, and was basically the person who created the original critical care trauma center in, uh, in London at the old Victoria Hospital. He finished his career the last few years as physician in chief in Sunnybrook where um, he was actually the leader through the original SARS pandemic uh, that hit. Yeah, most people don't appreciate that, that uh, Toronto was, was one of the areas outside of um, the Far East that was impacted by SARS, but he was the leader through that and suddenly his involvement and leadership through that led to a number of changes that have really helped put critical care on the map in Ontario in particular. <clears throat> and unfortunately in 2006, he passed away from, uh, from a cancer and the Bill Sybil lectureship was created in partnership between London and Toronto uh, to honor his contributions to our profession. Um, he was not only a clinician, he was a basic scientist. This was the Lab group in the early days, this might have been around the time that Marlies was uh, a fellow uh, in London, uh, although she's not in this picture, but there are other people in this picture that uh, you may or may not recognize, like Dr. Harris, Dr. Mehta, Dr. McCormick, and there's Bill at the, in the back. Um, I went the wrong way here. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, right, so, uh, so the, this is the list of the previous recipients of the Bill Civil Lectureship, just to uh, continue to uh, honor their contributions. And um, uh, we're very happy this year to have Marlies as our visiting professor. Um, what can I say about uh, Marlies? She's currently a professor uh, and a consultant in critical care and nephrology at Guy's in St. Thomas in the other London. Um, did her medical school in Germany, and then did some of her postgraduate training in the UK before coming to London where she did her critical care training. And if her, uh, one, just before we started the session, uh, we're talking about contemporaries. And if I recall correctly, a contemporary, and I can't see who all is on the call, but it's none other than uh, Scott Anderson. Uh, I believe is that correctly were the two of the fellows in that time. Um, <clears throat> she's gone on to a very productive career uh, back in London, uh, most very engaged with uh, critical care in the UK and acute kidney injury in particular. And um, <clears throat> I was saying, as we were chatting before getting this session started, uh, what goes around comes around. I'm making a habit of, of uh, completing the circle and learning from people that uh, were previous trainees uh, uh, in London or that I might have helped mentor at some point. So at one, at one point when uh, Kuro Claire in London, in our London was looking at bringing uh, CRRT more firmly into the Kuro Care fold, I went to the UK and, and did a workshop on uh, CRRT and Marlies was one of the leaders of that workshop uh, and it was an excellent session. Um, so, um, <clears throat> and here's, and we've, you know, periodically at the European meetings been able to uh, 
renew our acquaintances. I think this might have been one of their last times, and that was in Milan. And you can see our esteemed chair, current chair, Wael, and myself, uh, and Marlies, enjoying a little bit of um, dinner in a time when you could still freely go to restaurants without having to show proof of vaccination or, or masks. So I don't want to take any more time, but I definitely uh, send a warm welcome to Marlies. I wish we could be doing this in person again, and and uh, maybe in the near future might be able to share another meal uh, and uh, get together. Uh, that would be uh, very wonderful. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. I know it's late in the evening in the UK, um, and we start certainly appreciate you taking the time to present to our group. So I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, turn it over to Marlies, I think. Uh, thank you, Claudio. Thank you for this uh, wonderful introduction. And really thank you to the whole team, in, in particular, Wael, for, for inviting me to contribute to this lecture series. It really is a great honor for me. Um, just need to get my full screen on. Um, because I had a fantastic, a wonderful time in London, Ontario, and it clearly influenced my, my career and um, changed what I was doing at the time. So I owe uh, a lot. I owe the team in, in London, Ontario a lot, and, and in particular, Bill Sibbald. Uh, so in the next um, 30 minutes, I was going to, I'm planning to talk about nephrology in critical care with focus on our experience during the COVID wave. And uh, I've chosen this topic because it was a major challenge for us, but it has some links to Bill Sibbald uh, because Bill truly, was a mentor to me and was somebody who helped me um, in my career. And if I just go back to uh, the mid 90s, at that time, I was a committed nephrologist. I was, I liked nephrology, I wanted to be a nephrologist. And all I wanted to do was have a bit of training in critical care, because I believed that this would be useful to look after critically ill kidney patients. And I wanted to do my best for them and know what to say when communicating with intensive care clinicians who I was very scared of. But at that time, there was no way for me as a nephrologist to get any form of training. And my options were either to go and change and do anesthesiology or leave the UK. Uh, I got some advice and people said, well, if you want to really have some training, you have to leave if you don't want to give up nephrology. And, but if you prepare to leave, then I would suggest either Canada or South Africa, where they have established critical care programs. And uh, at that time, I was happy to go somewhere else. I was quite excited to have some training somewhere else. And the person who was recommended to me was Bill Sibbert. And he was described to me as somebody who was, had vision, who was a fantastic teacher, who had a passion for physiology. Uh, he was described as somebody with boundless energy and boundless imagination and a strong believer in teaching and physiology and uh, supporting people. And that sounded great to me. And so that's when I applied and I came to London, Ontario and indeed had a wonderful time during my 21 months there and met great people, had great teaching and uh, I'm still in contact with some people. And I wish I could be there now. But um, what I'm going to talk about really is the, our experience with during the COVID pandemic, in particular, our experience uh, and the challenges when looking after patients with kidney disease. And I will, uh, again, as I already said, uh, highlight that there is a link to Bill Sibbald, which I will emphasize at the end. When we faced the uh, pandemic in early 2020, we were very busy getting ventilators, infusion pumps, 
and we did not think of acute kidney injury as a major problem because we were led to believe that acute kidney injury wasn't part of COVID-19. And then very, very quickly, within the space of 10 to 14 days, we faced a major crisis in the UK. And here we have some pictures from the front pages. And they, this is exactly how it was in our, in our own hospital. We were very close to not being able to look after all the patients with acute kidney injury, in, in particular those who needed renal replacement therapy. And in retrospect, it's a little bit surprising because we were clearly very naive. We, we didn't, it was a new disease. We didn't quite know how to treat patients, what it, would in, what it involved, and we didn't know much about the pathophysiology. But if we had known a bit more, then we would have known that it's not surprising that the kidneys are affected in COVID-19 because clearly the pathophysiology starts with the binding of the virus to the ACE2 receptor and then the subsequent triggering of various processes, including cytotoxicity, uh, the activation of inflammatory pathways, the activation of the clotting cascade and the formation of microthrombi and the occlusion of various blood vessels. And if we just think of the ACE2 receptor alone, then it's clear that the kidneys are potentially a victim because the kidneys belong to the organs with a very high density and very uh, high number of ACE2 receptors. And within the kidney, uh, and certainly the crisis prompted me to look, to review the anatomy and the physiology of the kidneys again. Within the kidney, the ACE2 receptors are present in multiple places. Here we have the nephron with the glomerulus and the podocytes, keeping the glomerular capillary loops in shape. And ACE2 receptors can be found in multiple places on podocytes, on the glomerular capillaries, on tubular cells, and on peritubular arteries. And in fact, the density of ACE2 receptors in the kidneys is much higher than in many other organs, including the lungs, which we were very worried about. And so when re autopsy reports like this were published in mid 2020, suggesting viral inclusion bodies in different parts of the kidney, so in peritubular arteries and in the glomerular capillary loops, it all made sense. We knew there were, that's where the ACE2 receptors were. And subsequent autopsy reports suggested histopathological features consistent with COVID-19, so microthrombi, tubular cell damage, consistent with cytotoxicity, and again, viral inclusion bodies. And with this in mind, it was obvious and clear that the kidneys were victims. Subsequently, we even learned that viral genetic material was found in parts of the kidney, even when uh, histopathological changes were not detectable yet. And again, this genetic material, viral material, could be seen exactly where the ACE2 receptors are found on the glomeruli, in peritubular arteries. So viral infection may well be a contributor to acute kidney injury in COVID-19. And if that's the case, then the vascular consequences, so microthrombi, inflammation, tubular injury may contribute. And then there may also be other factors causing acute kidney injury, including cytokines, which obviously can be found in COVID-19. And cytokines are small substances that get filtered and then damage tubular cells from within the tubules. And then obviously there are the usual risk factors for acute kidney injury, including hemodynamic instability, uh, hypo and hypervolemia, and exposure to nephrotoxic drugs. So all of this together meant that it was should, we shouldn't have been so surprised that acute kidney injury was a very common feature of COVID-19 patients, in COVID-19 patients. And there were so many contributing factors, some may be directly related to COVID-19 and others are just part of critical illness. And as I already said, uh, in April, 2020, uh, in our hospital, 
we reached a crisis point because the number of patients with acute kidney injury was increasing and very high. And the number of people who needed renal replacement therapy was uh, exceeding our capacity. And we were at risk of not meeting the demand. And when we look back, we, as I said, we were surprised. We, we hadn't quite expected this. We, we were overwhelmed. But we also noticed that there were differences. Some hospitals in the UK and some hospitals in other parts of the world didn't see this large number of patients. And in fact, some people said acute kidney injury didn't really exist in their hands. And the question is, why did we have these differences in epidemiology? It is certainly possible that the, the patient population may have been different and they may have varied. There may have been differences in acute and chronic comorbidities. It may be that there are different, were differences in the way we manage patients in general, and we may have in our hands been more aggressive with diuretics or other nephrotoxic drugs, all possible. And it's also possible that there were genetic differences because if we just look at the ACE2 receptor, then it's well known that there are genetic differences in the ACE2 expression between uh, people from different genetic backgrounds. And if you just look at ACE2 receptor expression within different parts of the tubule and compare different patient, genetically different patient populations, then there are major differences. And it is possible that this contributed to the differences in epidemiology. But nevertheless, our problem was a crisis in, um, we had a crisis in uh, at the end of March, early April, 2020. And this shows our, uh, the uh, hospital admissions or the ICU admissions, sorry, in the first wave in April, end of March, early April, and then May. And in red, we have patients with COVID-19 requiring critical care admission, uh, needing level three support, so organ support. And in green, you have patients with COVID-19 requiring level two support, so more high dependency um, level like. And within two weeks, we saw a rapid increase in the number of patients who needed to come to the intensive care unit. We normally only have, or we, up to that point, we had 63 critical care beds in the whole hospital. This ex, the number of admissions exceeded our beds. So we expanded and went into other areas, including the recovery area, including the respiratory failure unit. But we also did double pendenting, which essentially means we put two beds into one bed space. So we had almost double the number of patients in our uh, ICU. Now this meant it was quite cramped and crowded and, and there wasn't much space left, but at least patients were in the critical care unit. With the number of patients coming to the critical care unit, there were more patients with acute kidney injury. And of those, the number of patients who needed renal replacement therapy was rapidly escalating. And at peak, uh, we had 44 patients who needed renal replacement therapy. We only had up before then, 26 CRRT machines. And CRRT was our main and only form of renal replacement therapy up to that point. And the whole crisis was made worse by the fact that the supplies uh, of consumables rapidly decreased. So in the UK, uh, the delivery of commercial fluids, catheters and circuits all comes from mainland Europe. So we were dependent on deliveries from mainland Europe uh, and so were other countries in Europe. And essentially the companies stopped, not completely stopped, but reduced the delivery to the UK. So by the first week in April, we had this increasing number of patients who needed renal replacement therapy, either because they had severe acute kidney injury or because they were dialysis patients or they were transplant patients with a failing graft. We did not have enough CRRT machines. And on top of everything, we noticed that our normal renal replacement therapy protocol didn't work. We, had, we saw premature filter clotting, which we hadn't really experienced for, for many years. The normal 
our normal anticoagulation protocol was insufficient and patients seemed to need renal replacement therapy for longer than ever before. And to compound, the, to make it even worse, we had less staff available to look after patients who need renal replacement therapy. It's usually delivered by our ICU nurses, but obviously in this case, they were looking after many more patients. We had double the number of patients in the ICU and there were less people available to provide renal replacement therapy. And this uh, period, these seven to 10 days, exposed a chronic hidden problem in the UK, the fact that the UK in principle didn't have uh, enough critical care beds to start with. Even at best, the number of critical care beds in the UK per population is significantly lower than in many other countries. But we couldn't change that at the time. All we, we had to face and deal with what was in front of us. And in front of us on the Friday before Easter was the escalating number of patients who needed renal replacement therapy in the context of reducing uh, supplies and not having enough CRT machines. So all we could do, at the, do the best and identify those who absolutely needed renal replacement therapy and change the criteria, try to treat severe acute kidney injury medically and share the available resources as much as we could. So we changed from CRRT, continuous renal replacement therapy to prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy or even intermittent just for a few hours, expand, extended the periods between the sessions and uh, had fantastic support by our renal colleagues who accepted patients to the renal unit as, as early as possible. As soon as they were of any respiratory support, they would go to the renal unit for intermittent hemodialysis. And then the subsequent week was characterized by um, fluctuating challenges because as soon as we had sorted out one problem, new problems arose because the, we were so uh, vulnerable to external factors and in particular, the changing supplies from mainland Europe. We would, for days, we would be out of fluids and then fluids arrive, but by that, then we would be out of circuits or catheters. And we had to be uh, very inventive and innovative to meet the challenge as they, challenges as they arose on the day. We clearly, uh, did our absolute best not to waste anything. We paid much more attention to selecting people who had renal replacement therapy or needed renal replacement therapy. We paid much more attention to our anticoagulation protocol and to uh, using the minimum dose of renal replacement therapy. The patients only got what they absolutely needed. And then we feared that we would run out of capacity. Uh, we realized uh, just after Easter that we only had fluids left for about 48 hours and there was no sight of any more fluids coming. And at that time, we considered acute PD in the ICU as it had already been started in the hospital next to us. Uh, by that point, we had already done everything possible to treat acute kidney injury as medically as best as possible. So we had introduced a a rapid guideline to inform clinicians how to treat acute kidney injury medically, severe acute kidney injury. So we introduced potassium binders, which was the first time in my life that I had used a potassium binder in critical care. We used phosphate binders, we used more bicarbonate and diuretics. But there was still no sight of any fluids coming. Uh, and we knew we only had fluids for about 48 hours. That's when a fellow from another, from Thailand, who was working with us, looked at me and said, so what's your problem, Alice? Just make it yourself. And I was a bit surprised. And she says, well, we make, we don't have commercial fluids. We make the fluids ourselves every single day. And so with her help and immediate co collaboration with our pharmacy colleagues, we use the aseptic pharmacy unit, which where normally TPN is made, and produce dialysis fluid. And it turned out it was actually very easy to do. All you had to do is mix some saline, some bicarbonate and some water, and you could produce dialysis fluid. 
And the team didn't, in the hospital, we didn't need any TPN anymore. So we used the TPN bags as our dialysis fluid bags. And very rapidly, the team in pharmacy produced a total of 2,500 liters of fluid. And clearly our fluid was very simple compared to commercially available fluid. It only contains some pseudosodium bicarbonate, chloride and water. Uh, I didn't have any other electrolytes, but it allowed us to stretch the existing resources and it allowed us to stretch what we had available, the fluids which we had. And so patients would be dialyzed with two commercial, using two commercial bags and one homemade bag. And this got us through a couple of days and then more fluid became, was delivered again. But it was certainly, it certainly saved us and it certainly, I believe, saved the life of a couple of patients who would otherwise have had no dialysis. We obviously didn't know whether fluid was coming or not. And we explored all options and uh, colleagues told me about uh, methods to produce fluids much, in much larger quantities using standard dialysis machines. And there are a couple of places in the, in the world where this was done, including here um, at John Hopkins University. And they essentially produced huge amounts of fluid, dialysis fluid, which they was then used to deliver renal replacement therapy in the ICU. We were very close to doing this. Our renal technicians had already started, but uh, fortunately we didn't have to come to this. But the, the team, certainly in John Hopkins and other places, demonstrated that this could be done. And certainly the fluids which they produce was effective, saved lives, and was sterile and um, in their microbiology assessment, very uh, aseptic. We uh, got through these few days or 10 days through the production of our own fluid. Uh, we never started doing acute PD. We were very close to this, but we were in regular contact with colleagues in the hospital uh, just two miles down the road, King's College Hospital, which obviously faced similar problems. And they introduced acute PD together with many other clinicians across in the world, uh, in New York, in Japan, and many different places in Europe. And my colleagues were extremely concerned about acute PD. Uh, they thought this would be a nightmare. Uh, they were concerned about acute PD in patients who had to be proned. Uh, so we didn't get to this stage, but the feedback from other places, including our colleagues down the road, has been extremely positive. And certainly the reports in the literature suggest that this is a, an absolutely viable solution with a, an acceptable, not increased risk of complications. And certainly that's something which may, uh, should be kept in mind when facing challenges like this. this in this case, it was a pandemic, but the, between all of us, we may face other challenges including natural disasters or other, vir or other infections. Uh, whilst at the time when we were producing our own fluid um, to stretch the existing delivery, uh, very rapidly the uh, Department of Health took over and uh, was put in charge of fluid uh, prescription fluid uh, requests and more importantly fluid allocation and so within a few days hospitals could no longer uh, put in an order for fluids or other consumables it all had to go through the department of health who would uh, centrally allocate fluids and other consumables according to the needs and on days when there was no fluid coming from from mainland europe they even ordered hospitals to uh, share uh, or send consumables to other places who faced um, an increasing number of people. So this became completely centralized. 
the uh, ambulance services in London and other bigger cities got reorganized to uh, make sure that the dialysis patients who didn't absolutely need critical care would not be sent to a hospital with uh, a large number of critically ill patients. And so they would go be sent to the next renal unit, even if the journey meant, or even if it meant to be a little bit longer in the ambulance and a longer journey. Very rapidly, there was strong collaboration between uh, societies that hadn't really worked together very well, but uh, clearly saw the need. And this uh, is particularly relevant for the Intensive Care Society and the Renal Association, who uh, developed this rapid clinical practice guideline for managing patients with acute kidney injury in critical care on the ward, and also uh, the provision of renal replacement therapy. And it includes a large educational part, including um, some guidance for the training of dialysis nurses working in critical care and vice versa. And lastly, the, rec the government recognized that research was important, that we had to learn more about this disease, which was causing such a big challenge and almost uh, leading to the collapse of the national health system. And so they stopped all non-COVID research and uh, developed this concept of urgent public health studies, UPH studies, and essentially mandated, almost mandated hospitals to participate in urgent public health studies, of which we all know it's recovery study, the um, remap cap, and many other studies. They were uh, heavily um, promoted uh, and almost mandated by the Department of Health. And they, Department of Health ordered hospitals to uh, have research teams available to deliver these urgent public health studies. And that was clearly a fantastic step in the right direction. Unfortunately, it meant that all other research had to be stopped. Uh, a lot of people became very inventive, and we certainly became inventive. We developed our own dialysis fluid. But uh, just as an example, I want to show this where we, we uh, many places across the world did uh, explore uh, new options and therapies. And certainly uh, when I read this report that about popliteal vascular access for renal replacement therapy was something I had not thought of, but in, in this case, it seemed to be a good option for people who were being prone or in the prone position most of the time. So it was a clearly very challenging time, but it was also a time where we essentially reviewed what we were doing and looked at all, opened all possible doors to see whether there were opportunities to help us getting through this crisis. Acute kidney injury was a problem for us, but it was in just talking to people across the world, it was a problem in many places. And so the APKI committee uh, organized a, um, an urgent APKI meeting, it was a virtual meeting in June 2020 for people to share their experience, to um, help, uh, to, to pass on what had helped them, and also to provide some guidance for those who were facing the first COVID wave, because it was also obviously happening at different times in different places. And at that time, we uh, felt that acute kidney injury was a multifactorial problem, given uh, what I've already said earlier. We, at that time, felt there was probably potentially a, a direct viral component causing to acute kidney injury, given the autopsy reports. We were quite concerned that there were additional features causing or contributing to acute kidney injury, in particular fluid management and exposure to nephrotoxins, uh, and ultimately concluded that, uh, that acute kidney injury in COVID-19 patients was a multifactorial uh, important part of COVID-19, which at the time, and I believe it's still the case, didn't really have any specific treatments. Certainly at that time when we met, which is June, 2020, the disease was six months old. It was a baby disease. There were lots of reports in the literature and it was all conflicting, but there was no clear evidence that there was any specific treatment for this condition. And 
we we were so key so eager to see whether any antivirus or anticoagulants and or anti-inflammatory drugs may help. We're hoping they would, because it seemed to make sense, and it seemed to make sense that uh, microthrombi and inflammation played a role in the pathogenesis. But at that time, we couldn't find really any evidence, and I'm afraid even to day, and I will show you some studies, there is no evidence that any of these therapies play a role in the management of acute kidney injury. We believe that uh, hypovolemia and too many diuretics or too high diuretic doses may have contributed to some of the AKI in some patients and ultimately gave the advice that fluid management should aim to keep patients euvolemic rather than too dry but giving too much fluid is probably not helpful either. And all other recommendations are really very similar to management of acute kidney injury in general. Subsequently to this meeting and to the subsequent to this recommendation, some studies were published, including the remdesivir trial. And the remdesivir trial obviously was negative. Um, it did not include patients with acute kidney injury but when you look at the onset of acute kidney injury, there was no real difference between the two groups. So if viral infection plays a role in the onset of acute kidney injury, then at the moment, there is at that point, there is no evidence that antivirals can stop this. And the same uh, was shown in the solidarity trial where they looked at other antivirals and some other medications, obviously hydroxychloroquine, and again, really no evidence that any antivirus changed the onset or the progression of, the, of kidney injury. Obviously, they also didn't really show change mortality. With regards to anti-inflammatories, at the time, um, there was very little in the literature, but uh, subsequently the recovery trial was published. And again, the recovery was trial was heavily promoted by the Department of Health in the UK. It was one of the first urgent public health studies, hence a large rapid recruitment in hospitals. And uh, it obviously showed the benefit of dexamethasone. It was a pragmatic trial. They didn't have any renal exclusion criteria, but they also didn't look at renal outcomes. So we don't know whether dexamethasone played a role or not. Uh, the data collection was very minimal and renal outcome data were not collected. The recovery trial also had, uh, has obviously had many arms and it's still going on, but tocilizumab was one of the arms and in the tocilizumab, the uh, interleukin-6 antagonist uh, arm, the, the team looked at um, 4,116 patients of whom half received tocilizumab and the other standard care. And if you compare, uh, look at renal outcomes, then the only data available are the use of hemodialysis or hemofiltration here at the bottom. And there was a statistically significant difference. There was obviously also a difference in mortality and a difference in the number of patients who left ICU alive. So positive trial, which led to the uh, introduction, routine introduction of tocilizumab in the UK. Uh, the use of hemodialysis was reduced and it may be that it indeed prevents acute kidney injury, but I'm not sure because hemodialysis or use of hemodialysis or hemofiltration is clearly very subjective and uh, it was quite subjective in, in our, not subjective, but we had very strict criteria in our clinical practice at the time. And with regards to other therapies, which in theory could make a difference like anticoagulations or anti-inflammatories in the form of statins or maybe even ACE inhibitors. At that time, there were no data available. And even now there are no data available the various anticoagulation trials have not shown any difference in any renal outcomes. And whether ACE inhibitors may have a role or not, again, needs to be awaited. The remap cup trial is currently looking at ACE2 receptors inhibitors, uh, but we don't know. 
What the expert meeting did highlight was the uh, importance of renal replacement therapy and more importantly, the fact that all different modalities really have a role or ha have a role in a crisis. And it was, although we were a com complete CRIT unit where CRIT is our only modality in the intensive care unit, we introduced other modalities and we were open to using acute PD, which in the end we didn't do, but we would have done it if, the, if it had got worse. And in retrospect, and following on from, the, from this um, meeting, but also as part of the COVID pandemic management, we have learned that any form of renal replacement therapy, available renal replacement therapy modality has advantages, and they may be very beneficial in a crisis and has some disadvantages. And CRRT, our preferred option normally, clearly had some disadvantages. We are completely dependent on fluids and, and, and consumables from sent from other countries. Uh, intermittent hemodialysis had the beauty and the advantage that it could be delivered in-house using our um, in-house water supply. So we've opened our eyes and acknowledged the different forms of renal replacement therapy again. And through this work, we, I believe we've also become much more resilient for future crises, which the future crisis could be another pandemic, it could be an infection, but it may also be a natural disaster. And certainly in this meeting, there were people who had um, experienced uh, and had managed renal replacement therapy in the Ebola crisis or Ebola pandemic and others had managed renal replacement therapy uh, during periods of earthquakes. And this, in this case, it was COVID-19, but we together put a plan, put, put a plan together which can serve as a template to help uh, clinicians in these forms of crisis where you're overwhelmed by the number of people who suddenly need renal replacement therapy. And there are ways to prepare for this. Uh, uh, we didn't have time to prepare for it, but we were found ourselves right in the middle of it suddenly. But even then there are some general principles and there is, it's important to remember that all forms of renal replacement therapy have, an, have a role and that there are a lot of other colleagues around who can help. We certainly depend on our renal colleagues be very much dependent on our renal technicians and suddenly had appreciated uh, their role and their input. I'm coming to the end now. Um, and I want to say we, we got through the crisis, but it was also uh, difficult uh, to motivate people at times because as we were making every effort to provide renal replacement therapy to people with severe acute kidney injury or dialysis patients, ICNARC, uh, was obviously fantastic. They reported, gave us weekly reports of the state and the prognosis of COVID patients in ICUs in the UK, of all ICUs, because it's a mandatory audit requirement. And they had all the data. Every week there would be a report telling us the mortality rate and the duration in ICU. And then when the first reports came out, they indeed reported that the mortality of patients who needed renal replacement therapy was about 85%. And this led some people to believe that renal replacement therapy should actually not be offered anymore. It was difficult to do, it was had so many challenges and at the end, so many people died. The mortality was 85%. Fortunately, the, the uh, outcomes improved and um, the mortality rate or the survival rate increased as we learned more about how to manage patients and as the therapeutic options improved uh, globally. Now, the mortality rates in the UK were high in the beginning, they improved. Uh, we were obviously shocked to see this. Uh, this was one of the, was in some respect, having day, weekly updates was a benefit, but it also obviously can give you these shocking, very disheartening reports. In retrospect, we now know that our mortality rates in the beginning were very similar to that of many other countries. 
we were just unfortunate to hear about it so early. But here, if you have a report like this one from US hospitals, again, they reported a mortality rate uh, greater than 50% in patients who needed, with acute kidney injury, who needed renal replacement therapy. And now as we've now emerged from our third wave, the question is, was it all different? And is AKI and COVID-19 truly different? Or was it just that it, we were just so overwhelmed by a new, new illness and which we didn't understand and uh, overwhelmed by, by the sheer number of patients who were ill? And some people believe AKI in, in COVID-19 is no different from any other acute kidney injury in critically ill patients. Whether this is true or not, I don't know, but certainly if you compare them side by side, there are a lot of similarities. And I was always, I always thought there was a difference because I was convinced by the electron microscopy picture showing viral inclusion bodies that it, this made sense to me. It made sense given that the kidney is full of ACE2 receptors uh, and the viral had, virus had been detected in urine. But recently, obviously, reports have come out suggesting that what has been reported as viral inclusion bodies may actually have been artifacts on electron microscopy. So the honest answer is I do not know whether viral infection plays a role or not. I can say that antivirals haven't changed the um, made a difference to the onset of acute kidney injury. I don't know whether, but I, I believe uh, there may, I accept there are many factors which contribute to acute kidney injury. Uh, and the question whether viral infection plays a role or not is open. What I'm much more concerned about now is actually the plight of the survivors. And um, this paper by Perry Wilson from Yale University suggests that they have a significantly increased risk of developing chronic kidney disease. So in this paper, he compared the uh, renal outcome of 183 patients who had acute kidney injury in the context of COVID-19 and were in hospital, not just ICU, they were in hospital, and compared them with the renal outcome of uh, patients in hospital with acute kidney injury of other etiologies, but not COVID. And in the subsequent nine, 90 days, patients who had had acute kidney injury in the context of COVID had a significantly more worse uh, or greater decline in renal function compared to other patients. And if this is true, and if this applies to people, patients in other places of the world, then we will face a, a, a pandemic of chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal failure in the next few years. Now, this was the single center study. So we looked at our own group of patients. And as I said, we were overwhelmed by people with acute kidney injury in the first wave, where three out of four patients in ICU had acute kidney injury and the majority had, patient, had acute kidney injury stage three. And when we followed them up uh, recently and looked at the outcome of survivors, then again, we also showed that one in six survivors had new chronic kidney disease at 90 days. Again, again a single center study, but if, if this is true, we will see many more patients with chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal failure in the next few years. This brings me to my end. It was a very challenging time. Uh, I thought of Bill Sibbert many times because I was in contact with him and he was uh, managing the SARS outbreak in, in Toronto. I believe that uh, he helped certainly me uh, and many other people uh, through managing crises like that. And it was challenging, but it wasn't all bad. And there were certainly moments when we learned to be innovative, when we explored new things, we produced our own dialysis fluids, something I thought we could never do. Uh, colleagues, successfully delivered acute peritoneal dialysis, something I had never dreamt of doing. And now 
a year later, or one and a half years later, we are at the place where we have more CRRT machines. We have, we are much more resilient. We've put in an application for a reverse osmosis unit, really to become independent of these consumables and to become more independent of, of commercially delivered, commercial fluids delivered by trucks and trains from another country, which is also not very green. We have uh, strengthened our collaboration with other departments and teams, including in particular the Reno team and the Reno technician team. We've developed a training program for the nurses, for in critical care and the dialysis unit to exchange their knowledge and to be able to work in both departments. The healthcare system in South London has been restructured with a, really with a plan to provide mutual aid more quickly. And I believe we, we are much more resilient and prepared for another crisis, which may be a natural disaster or something else. And finally, through the uh, mandate of having urgent public health studies and the mandate to participate in research, the research infrastructure has improved a lot. We're still trying to start non-COVID studies again, but um, we all recognize that research is so important. There's much more guidelines available. And so now at the end, a lot of good things have come out of it. And whilst I was preparing this, again, I recognized and again acknowledged the the training which I had had in Canada, and I thought of Bill Sibbert on many occasions. And also uh, in preparation of the talk, I came across some of his quotes, where he said the, the power of public health was so important to get him get help uh, people in Toronto to get through the SARS outbreak, I would say exactly the same. And he foresaw that uh, there would be worse pandemics than the SARS pandemic at the time and he was right and so with that I want to finish and again say that uh, I had such a great time in, in Canada and I really owe my my career to the training which I had in 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 London Ontario thank you Thank you very much, Dr. Osterman. That was a fantastic presentation and a walkthrough. Uh, I think made us a lot of us feel better that uh, our experience with COVID and acute kidney injury was not so different from uh, across the across the, the pond. So uh, I'll give an opportunity if people want to ask questions. If people can just type in the chat uh, so we can get some sort of order. Um, Dr. Hedera initially I was asked a question about what are you going to retain from your different innovations during COVID, but I think you kind of spoke to that, uh, a move towards sort of finding a more independent, uh, self-sustainable strategy. So if you wanted to expand on that, I'll go ahead. And then the second one was a comment, which I may make in my own question, but uh, he was saying most places saw non-COVID research stop anyways. So your Department of Health actively ensuring recruitment for COVID trials and privileging that research sounds very progressive. Uh, he says, we wish we had been that insistent uh, we did well voluntarily, but not sure that was the case across the province. So I guess my question for you and maybe if any of the other uh, researchers are on here is with hindsight, do you think that deprioritizing all non-COVID research was, uh, was helpful, was justified? Or would you do it again that way or would you have had a bit more balance across the system? So start off with that maybe. Uh it was helpful. It was no, it's no, no question. It was absolutely helpful. The um, that's we we the, the contribution to remap cap to recovery it was fantastic from the UK. Um, we rapidly had um, the the results of the recovery trial, which changed clinical practice, and it was only possible because that's what the government said, and they stopped all non-COVID research. So at the time, it was very important. I think I would I supported it and I would still support it and I think we have would have to do it again. What has been incredibly difficult is the restart. So because everything was stopped in our hospital when we were allowed to start again, the the R and D department uh, was facing the restart of one thousand and ninety eight studies which had all been paused across the departments, 
And that was very, very difficult because they were just a small team as well. And people argued and which one is more important is the, um, is the commercial, is the, the novel first in man anti-cancer trial more important than a trial me looking at acute kidney injury. That's been very hard. And I also accept that it's been hard for many cancer studies in particular, where people stop having access to potentially life-saving new therapies. But that, that, I think it had to be done. And without the mandate, we wouldn't have had the results. And they, they also put um, made funding available, I should say that, and, allow, and, and supported the formation of research, dedicated COVID research teams. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll keep asking if anybody has questions, they can either put them in the chat or unmute themselves. Um, I did have, oh, Alex, did you want to ask a question? Uh, hi, thank you so much. That was so informative. I just wanted to make a comment of how striking to me it is that there's this excess mortality in patients with COVID and AKI, and that, uh, you know, we're not seeing this just in um, renal, uh, in the kidneys, but in other organs as well. And I, as a clinician and scientist, I just find it phenomenal that you know, a virus that doesn't seem to directly involve these tissues seems to uh, cause this excess damage for some reason. Um, you know, very unlike other organisms. So I just, you know, maybe also wonder what your thoughts on that are. And um, I just find it fascinating. Good question. I, I don't know why the mortality was so high in 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 the the patient with renal replacement. I mean, we provide a renal replacement therapy differently. By the time people had renal replacement therapy, they really were either hyperkalemic or acidotic. Uh, uh, but I don't, such a good question. I don't know why it was so high at the beginning, and I still don't know. And I guess, sir, I'll just follow that up, but just the excess mortality in individuals who survive and have, you know, with COVID and have a renal injury compared to individuals who survive and have a renal injury, but not due to COVID. That's, mm. uh, you know, I, that, that's, that's phenomenal to me too. Thank you. No, no I agree. And, and then the first um, ICNAC reports, you, I'm sure you know, so ICNAC is the Institute for um, Audit and and clinical research. So it's a, again, it's a mandate. It's mandatory for hospitals, for all critical care units to report the uh, data of their patients to this, to the, um, this particular audit. Uh, and this includes uh, organ, type of organ support, severity of illness and so forth. And that's been in place for more than 15 years, no, for 20 years. Uh, but during COVID, this became absolutely informative. And it was so good to hear what what the outcome was, how other how other places in the UK behaved. But the the um, information about patients on renal replacement therapy was absolutely heart sinking. And as I said, to some point, that people said, um, "Well, we, we should not offer renal replacement therapy anymore. It's hard to do. Uh, we don't have the resources, and the people die anyway." And there were, there were quite strong voices in the UK, in the in national health system, who truly felt that, re, by the, if patients needed renal replacement therapy for acute kidney injury, it should not be offered anymore. Hmm. Uh, and I don't know why there was such a high excess motor. I don't know. Thank you. Maybe we can go to Dr. Bosma, I think is a question has her hand up. Hi, thank you. Um, Marlies, my name is Karen Bosma, and um, I'm one of the ICU doctors in London, and I've heard many great things about you over the years, so you're a bit of a legend in London, so it's great to hear your talk, and nice to meet you on Zoom. Um, I was wondering, you showed the graph of how mortality for patients receiving CRT went from, or survival went from 20% to 40%, so I'm glad you continue to offer CRT to doubles your um, survival rate. I was wondering if over the course of the series of waves, you noticed a difference 
in the phenotypes of patients? Did you see less patients requiring CRRT over time? Did you see less people getting a severe injury and less shock? Because my sense of things was that in the beginning, we had a lot of people with profound shock and multi-organ failure. And, in, and that kind of shifted over time to maybe pure hypoxemic respiratory failure. And I was wondering if you had similar impressions or, or what your thoughts were. No, absolutely. Uh, when, the, when the second wave hit us just before Christmas and then January uh, 20, January 21, uh, we were ready to, to, to deliver renal replacement therapy. We had stocked up, we, had, we were resilient, and then there was very little. So uh, the incidence of acute kidney injury was about, was just over 50% of the prevalence. And not many people needed renal replacement therapy. And I still do not know why, we just in the process of, of analyzing the two waves. Now, whether this is because the virus changed, it was a different strain, I don't know. But I think it may have been related to the fact that we treated patients so differently in the second wave. Um, we, by that point, people were getting routinely steroids. We were starting to use tocilizumab. Uh, the anticoagulation had changed. I think it was a combination of many things. And uh, so when we were ready to do, because we had more CRT machines, we had protocols, we knew what to do, we didn't have the patients. And the people who needed renal replacement therapy had a much better outcome. So it wasn't a big thing anymore. I, I don't know. And that's, again, why people, some people say it was never really a big thing. It was um, somehow, we, but it was always just AKI in the context of critical illness. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. It's, it's really fascinating that, um, that you have this data and you made so much out of it. So congratulations also for, um, for your observations and for... for uh, how to make dialysis fluid in the setting of a pandemic and and just for looking at this scientifically and everything you learned and shared it's 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 really helpful thank you yeah I share, but I learned from others and we uh, every day so the beauty was every day was a school day every day we learned something new we would be in contact with somebody somebody had an idea somebody had heard that people in in the U.S. are making dialysis fluid but using their conventional dialysis machine we were on the phone to them but it, it was also exciting. And, and truly every day was an exciting school day. And I think, but now think back to Bill Sibbald, he would have loved it. It was exactly that, new things, but he had boundless imagination and boundless energy. He would, when I was a fellow and so, something wasn't clear, he would say, just find it out. Just, 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 just tell me tomorrow what it is. So it, he would have loved it. And it, it, not everything was bad. It was, there were, it was excitement. Dr. Hader had another uh, question or comment. Uh, he said uh, he was apologizing for being muted. Um, he was struck by the viral inclusion bodies in the kidneys not turning out to be true or not turning out to be a, uh, an actionable item. He was wondering if you have thoughts on the sort of preprint med uh, XRIV publishing trend releasing study results through Twitter? Uh, is this a positive trend for democratizing data or is it a bad one that sort of sets us up for false impressions or how do we, how do we incorporate that trend into our future uh, medicine? That's a very good question. I mean, whether, they were, whether these viral inclusion bodies are artifacts or not, I honestly don't know. Um, I was absolutely convinced that they are viral inclusion, that, that the virus enters the kidneys. It all made sense to me, given the receptors. I still believe that some of the autopsy studies showing genetic material, uh, so outside electron microscopy, again, would support the virus somehow getting into the kidney. Um, except this report that maybe not all viral inclusion bodies were truly viral inclusion bodies and some may have been artifacts, but it doesn't mean that the virus does not get into the kidney. So I have an open mind at the moment. But uh, the, the, the second part of your question was, 
what do I think of the preprints? Uh, it, at that at that time, I was we were I was pleased to get any information, but in retrospect, clearly there was so much confusing medic information, wrong medication uh, information, misinformation. So in retrospect, I wished. Yeah, in retrospect, I think it wasn't a good idea. It wasn't good. But but we were dealing with a disease that was a baby disease. It was three months old. But I, I, I we were misled too, uh, and I believe others were misled, and some patients were mistreated. Absolutely. Um, I'll pass off to Dr. Martin uh, to get a comment. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Marlise, and thanks so much for digging up that reference to Bill and his comments on accolades towards public health. So two questions, one that are totally unrelated. One is, um, so he wrote that back in 2006 and we did, you know, the world did go through SARS and we've had other pandemics in the interval, MERS, COVID, Ebola. Um, so how do we ensure we remember these lessons? So that's the one question. And, the second totally unrelated one is when this all started, um, we were concerned that we were gonna run out of ventilators and there were initiatives to develop, you know, uh, simple ventilators that could be used in third world countries. Um, before fancy prison machines came along, we just did scuff with a filter and two, v you know. <laughs> um, so was there any thought to, um, to something along those lines for renal replacement? Therapy, I guess. Thanks. Um, so the first one, um, I don't know how we remember this. Um, probably only by by keeping in contact with people who who some some of our people who taught us, some mentors, people who survived uh, and managed these pandemics. Uh, for sure, if Bill was or had been alive. I would have been on the phone to him many times. I'm 100% sure. Uh, but it's learn passing the message on and 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 referring for us to refer to people who who've got the wisdom and experience. Um, and the question about just using very simple methods again. Yes, we did briefly think of using very simple methods to, to replace or substitute for renal replacement therapies. SCUF, we didn't quite get to that, but some, we, didn't, we didn't really explore it, but one of the technicians mentioned it, yes. And I think yeah. what it does do is it, it certainly, um, I think it, it it helped us trying to uh, understand the basics of renal replacement therapy again. What is it actually? You just need a membrane and a filter and you need some fluid. And the fluid doesn't have to be so complicated like the commercially available fluids. Even very simple fluids will do and a simple filter will probably do. So we suddenly appreciated the basics of these now very complex machineries and I think that's also what we have to teach trainees that these machines, which look so complicated, are actually deep inside, very simple. This is a brief, as a follow up, I was intrigued by you mentioned the peritoneal dialysis and some of the data yeah, that it actually could work. So, oh, yeah. is there a role maybe to uh, study that now in the non pandemic era to uh, maybe see whether it actually does have a role in selected? Yes. No, I'm sure, it, but it, in, in fairness, it has a, it, it is a um, first line therapy in many countries outside the high resource countries, but there are many middle or low income countries where, where acute PD is the only form of renal replacement therapy. Um, you need the expertise and all of us, I would say, I mean, I wouldn't have been able, even as an, with my renal background, I wouldn't have been able to look to do PD in the ICU without the help of the dialysis nurses. Uh, I, I think not, a lot of my colleagues would have definitely not been able to look after PD. So we, 
we can only we would only be able to do it if we have the support from the PD nurses who do it routinely. But that can be done, could be done. Uh, and certainly many countries in the world use acute PD as their only form of renal replacement therapy in ICU. I do believe we need to move away from something that's so uh, wasteful and like, like CRRT. I mean, we all our fluids in the UK are coming, are being shipped by lorries from mainland Europe every single day. Lorries, lor loads of lorries come over just to ship, to bring in dialysis fluid. Uh, and then COVID taught us that we're not really resilient. Suddenly they stop and, and every hospital is in a cri reaches crisis point. Well, Matt might be a, a note to end on the supply chain commentary is a fitting uh, era to this uh, COVID pandemic. But uh, unless there are any other questions in the chat, uh, which I don't see any, I guess I'll, uh, unless, uh, also I'll give Dr. Martin a chance to, to close as well. But thank you so much, Dr. Osterman. That was a, a wonderful tour of, uh, of CRT and acute kidney injury during the COVID pandemic. Uh, and we're very grateful for you taking the time uh, late on a Wednesday night to, uh, to give back to the Western. So we're, we're greatly appreciative and proud to call you one of our own. I, I really I owe my career to, to the team in London, Ontario, who taught and gave me the training, including Claudio Martin. So thanks so much, Marlies. I, that, that comment makes, uh, requires me to refer to the randomized trial that we published on uh, day six by infusion versus bolus therapy, which is correct. Um, like that's a sort of like uh, the, the, those are in the years where a resident could come for two years or less and actually a complete a randomized clinical trial because uh, the bureaucracy was much less uh, but uh, that's still a pivotal study in my mind um, that I don't think was ever repeated uh, Marlies initiated that study as a fellow um, uh, and I, no I delivered it you initiated it I don't know, my memory's vague. No, no, I delivered it. But, it was your uh, idea. Um, but it, it was carried out by Marlies uh, and then completed by one of our other fellows at the time, George Alvarez, and then and subsequently published. So um, Marlies has had a, you know, a, an impact on critical care and nephrology uh, throughout her whole career. And uh, it's been one of the fellows that I really enjoy staying in contact with and certainly hope that uh, that might be reestablished in the near future when things totally return to normal. Uh, in the meantime, thanks so much. I truly wish we had been able to do this uh, visiting professorship in, in person. Maybe that might still happen in the near future. Um, thanks again. I know it is late in the UK. Um, and as Paul said, we really appreciate your taking the time to speak to our group. Thank you so much. And uh, I will definitely come back to London to, to visit. Thanks again. Great. Thanks so much.